The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The brand new computer system that was put in play in 2023, it's already been hooked up to all financial sectors. It's already in operation. It's already running. People have been identified not by their social, but by biometric points. And everybody has a profile. Everybody who exists on this planet has a profile. And that profile is being tracked. Uh, it's being watched. So on and so forth. So it's not like anybody can escape this system. But it's not as intrusive as you may think. I want you guys to follow me in Revelation. I'm going to show you something. Because for the most part, people force people to do things. Spirits are extremely cunning. And they remain that way so that you don't believe it's a spirit. You think you're dealing with uh, just common happenstances in the world, and situations, things possibly you could have avoided. For example, right now, there are some people who believe in Christ. They know that freedom can be obtained through Christ. They don't have freedom. There are people out there who know scripture, but they're plagued by anger. Still, there are other people who seek to have peace and a type of happiness. They cannot obtain it, or at best, it's fleeting, it does not stay. They believe in their minds you cannot stay in that environment for a duration of time. That That's that's not right. If we can accomplish something, because often we count ourselves wise, we'll say, well, you know, I'm, I'm very learned in the Word of God, and I can't achieve it, so nobody can. We shouldn't think that way. That's not the way it works. And there are some people who do have peace and their lives are lived very differently. There are some people who don't deal with anger. They don't deal with confusion. They don't deal with pressure. They don't deal with any of those things because of how they see the world, how you see the world, right? A lot of people have read a lot of books. A lot of people have heard lots of videos. And so every thought in the Word of God, there's always something else attached to it. For example, many people have heard that these days that we live in right now are going to be like the days of Noah. So instantly people jump and they say, well, the days of Noah had giants. That's quite a popular saying. But if we examine the words of Christ, he wasn't quite talking about that. He was talking about mankind's activities. Now, do we still deal with those spirits that were in the giants? Of course we do, but we just don't deal with them directly. There's something that has happened since Christ that will not permit those spirits direct access to people like it, like they once had. They used to harm people big time. They can't do that without permission. When you're in agreement with anything on Dark Force, you've actually joined with them. That's where a lot of your troubles and internal anxieties come from. Then, of course, we have this idea that if we can feel happy, we're happy. If a person feels like their family, their family. If you feel like you have accomplished this or that, or if you feel like you're in a good place, you're good to go. Never trust that. Soon, mankind will feel like they have met their long lost family. They will weep for devils. They will weep for them as they do right now, but it's gonna get a lot worse. When you feel sympathy for a person, and it's one of those unnatural sympathies, you better be on guard. You cannot trust your emotions of uh, feeling good, of feeling like somehow something is peaceful, of having empathy for something. You can't trust that. People have to operate. If they really want to be free from these things, they have to operate. Just like Jesus said to operate. So we have things a lot of times so backwards. But here's what I found out in life. You ready? Number one, what's ugly is normally good. And what's beautiful is normally terrible. Beauty appealing to the eye. Why does it appeal to the eye? Because it's pleasing to us, correct? It's what we want to see. That's physical, not spiritual. Spiritual sees beyond anything external. It sees beyond the flesh of everything. So how could spirit be so pleased with what it sees physically appealing? As human beings, we want things to look physically appealing. We operate by that type of sight. But the Lord said, don't walk by how you see things. Walk by the Spirit, which means when you're navigating life, you don't operate by what feels good, what feels not so good. Don't operate that way. That will fool you. That will get you into situations you shouldn't be in. Most of you have had those situations. It felt right, didn't it? It felt good, but it was dangerous. It almost killed you. It drew you into something you could barely escape. And it all began because it felt right. 
And those things that we are have a reluctance towards, a natural reluctance towards. Normally, those things are good for us. For example, the worst, the, the worst tasting plant on planet Earth is the best for your body. The best tasting food you've ever tasted is likely bad for your body. It's just like medicine. It, you know, they have natural medicines that taste awful, but they're really good for your body. They have medicines that are, you know, they're kind of toned down. They taste pretty good. They don't do a lot. So trusting your eyes and navigating this world by your eyes is simply not enough. You can be fooled that way. Eve was fooled that way. She was tricked by the eye. She didn't operate spiritually with Satan. She operated by how she felt. If you look at her comments concerning the tree in the garden, she saw that it was good for food. That's a physical trait. That, that's some sort of physical interpretation. It was pleasant to look at. That's some sort of physical desire. That's something pleasing physically. She saw that it would make one wise. So it was a benefit based on her mindset. That too is of the flesh. So what was spiritual with Eve? Nothing. When she encountered Satan, it was absolutely nothing. God simply told her, don't eat of that tree. Dude, guys, don't eat of that tree. That should have been enough. But the flesh part of you will say, why? Like a rebellious child, they always say, why? They won't observe. They won't be patient. They always say, why? Why? And the world encourages everybody to say, why? People have all but slowed down their relationship with Christ by asking, why? Not being patient, observing, reflecting what, what the Lord told us to do. No, they say, why this and why that? That's a curiosity based in what though? The flesh. All these ways taught to us by the world. And they're doing something you may not notice. All these ways the world teaches, they have done something. I need you guys to put on your maturity hat. Can you do that? No one get offended because we're going to read out of the Bible. So no shockers, right? Nobody should be shocked. These are common things to us, or they should be common things to us. But if we don't examine them, they'll just simply stay in the book. Something that we should know, but we don't know. Because we found them to be, you know, less than uh, attractive or tasteful. We're going to have to discuss some things tonight. Like a society's virginity. Because it's not there anymore. And it's not coming back. There's a principle in the Bible that everybody should know. But they don't know it. And it can be directly related to flesh and to your life's experience. But because of immaturity or offenses, people won't look into it, though God spoke it. God spoke it more than once. He spoke it a few times. And it's a very important principle. In fact, without this principle, you're going to find yourself confused at quite a few things in the Word of God. With this principle, understanding it, you begin to understand some things and you can take appropriate action according to the, to the direction Christ gives and begin your track in life in a very different way. See, I don't know about you guys, but when you care about other people, you do not, you don't want them to have less than you do. If I had more than the other person spiritually, it doesn't make me more than that other person. That's hogwash. It just simply means I may have submitted in certain areas before they have, that's all. But why wouldn't a person share that? Isn't that what the gospel's all about? Isn't that part of the driving force behind the gospel? You become an experiencer, just like the apostles did. How could they hold that all to themselves? How could a person finding the kingdom of God or even a piece of it hold that to themselves that no one benefit from what they found? And we're not talking about things uh, in, in this physical realm. That's not what we're talking about. How many of you still have an issue with anger? You still have issues with depression. You still have issues with these negative thoughts that pop up. You still have great insecurities in the world. Your world can collapse at any time. It's very fragile, right? If we're honest with ourselves, most people suffer with these things. And you do not have to. There's one thing you're doing, though, you should analyze. In fact, if you have those issues, you stand to benefit from the principles we're going to read through tonight. Because you can understand them. You're not disconnected from them. Once you're disconnected from things for a long time, we tend to forget. Right? Just like a person who's broken their leg in their youth, they have forgotten the pain and discomfort they had with that brain. But while you're in the middle of it, you can also experience and become a witness of what it's actually doing. Because it's fresh in your mind, you can also help those who have that similar issue. So, so I'll propose this first. All of you who have anger issues, all of you who still fight with depression and fear and bouts of these, these anxiety, which seems to be plaguing the entirety of the world, all of you who do this, you stand to benefit the most. The world will tell you that you've got the issues and the problems. I'm telling you right now, you will benefit the most and you will be most helpful to other people. I don't really have those anxieties anymore. 
And it's not because I'm tough. It's because of Christ's principles. I don't look at the world like other people do. Have you noticed? Where everybody else gets upset, they may lose control or something like that. I don't lose control. I see small things where people see big things, and I see big things where people see small things. So it's almost like uh, um, you're seeing the opposite, or your acuity, your visual acuity is different because of Christ. He's the one that uh, opens the eyes, not us. We try to open our own eyes. We try to present to other folks that we're qualified doing what we're doing. No one need to ever do that. Case in point is this. How did that word Christian come about? Any of you know? It's right there in the Bible. Did Jesus start that? The answer is no. Did the apostles begin that? The answer is no. You know where that came from? That came from people observing the apostles. Did you guys know that? The people did. That did not come from the church. It didn't come from the apostles. It didn't come from Christ. That came from people. People said, hey, you're Christ-like. That's what that means. You're Christ-like. You're just like Christ. You're doing the same thing he's doing. So people became one. They gave people titles, didn't they? People did that. They did that through an accusation. That word Christian came through an accusation. That didn't come through something good. That came through something bad when people said, yeah, you're one of those. You're just like Christ. Yeah, go get him. Lock him up. That's where it came from. So through the assaults of the world, you have a title that moves your heart. Isn't that something? Through their accusations, there's a title that exists in the world that actually moves you. But it came from those who first accused you. See how God flips everything around. Do you see how he works? Anything Satan has meant toward you to make you fall, the Lord changes it. He has no authority to do that. He will always try. That's why he's Satan. He will always try. But he cannot succeed so long as you continue. He can't succeed. Once you find out what he's actually doing, that's when you become victorious. That's when you can move on. The apostles did not sit up and fight Lucifer every single day. They fended off Lucifer from people. That's what they did. They themselves were free of it, leaving them free to exploit, to see and experience the goodness of the Lord in ways that most people can only dream of. A lot of people today, they don't think things are possible because they can't obtain it. A lot of people say, well, you know, healings, they, they, they came back in those days. Probably not in this day and age. Well, they say that because they have not obtained a healing. Because they have gone into the Word of God and they have essentially tried to purchase a healing. How do you do that? That's when you go into the Word of God and say, okay, I'm going to do everything required to get this healing. That's what I'm going to do. That's not genuine. That's almost like purchasing a healing. That means you're willing to do what's required to obtain something from the Lord, but you're not willing to maintain it, make it a lifestyle, that it becomes part of you. Why would God ever grant anybody a healing that thinks like that in the first place? In other words, people have ran to Christianity and hoped to attain something. People have, they came to Christianity because they found brand new people there, right? That they can actually discuss and talk to. Many reasons have brought people to Christianity. But who are the real Christians inside that group that do indeed experience what the Lord has given them? What the Lord promised back then, he has for you right now. In a lot of cases, it cannot be obtained because Satan is fighting something and something that people are allowing him to have and to defeat. Care to know what that is? Or it's a very real fight. And people do, in fact, sometimes they lose this battle in certain days. If you stay with the Lord, you'll have the victory ultimately. But during the day, in certain days, you can lose that battle. You do that by giving in. You do that by falling back on earthly knowledge. That would almost be like me trying to find out what Christ is like by reading Zachariah Sinchin's books. That's not going to work. Our minds are full of rhetoric, full of ideas, full of other men's knowledge that compete with the simplicity of faith itself. So we're full of questions, not based on the teachings of Christ, but based on other people's words. We're full of questions that originate from all this other knowledge. And it causes us to do something the Bible said it would do, stumble. Enoch wrote a great length about this, how it caused mankind to stumble, ingesting knowledge from all these other folks. 
and then comparing that to the Word of God. So you end up naming what God gave you something that man said. I hear a lot of people in this day and age, they reference Zechariah's Ascension, the Anunnaki, and all those things, right? Trusting this one guy to have had everything right to the point where they will ask questions about things that a man wrote, not knowing the origin of that guy. Now, I, for one, I don't like his writings because he was against the faith. This guy was was um, something else. And so I can't take in the words of somebody who did not. He had no favoritism towards the faith. Clearly in his interpretations, he wrote something else, downcasting Christ. He supported the ideologies that Satan has been trying to sow from the beginning. I can't follow someone like that. Someone asked me, they said, well, he may have been wrong in certain areas, but still the other areas you have to consider. I said, no, I will not. I will consider what the Lord has given me. I will consider what the Lord has revealed in me. And if he does not reveal it in me, I won't operate by that knowledge. I may know it, but I need not speak it. I can take in, personally, I can take in knowledge from a lot of sources. I will never compare that knowledge, nor interject that knowledge in with the Holy Word of God. I'll never make that mistake. I've seen people make that mistake, and they get tied up for years. They're bogged down in the mind. They cannot be free because they have given themselves over to something else. Christ will always sit at the top seat in my life, and everything is subject to Him, not comparable to Him. That's a very uh, a good distinction that all of us could actually make and free ourselves from a lot of the bondage of this knowledge in these stores. I mean, they're coming big time now. It's caused the gospel to turn into some hybrid gospel. It really has. And we live in the days when people do not endure sound doctrine. The gospel is not enough for people. We know what the word says, that soon you won't be able to find the word of God in the earth anymore, which means it's absent the vessels that live in the earth, which means the earth is going through some drastic changes in every incident that you see around the globe. Is it not supporting hostilities and violence? It's not supporting faith. It's supporting these ancient ideologies. All these people who present things in their books and on television and everything you see. What's it doing? They're magnifying. Darkness is what they're doing. They're renaming the elements of darkness. They're causing people to have the same knowledge witches do. That's what they're doing. And people end up practicing the same thing witches and warlocks practice, which is necromancy. God said never do that. But what do people do? And it's pretty average today. They consider it. Even when they don't admit it, they consider it. Well, I wonder if I can talk to my grandmother. Well, I wonder if I can talk to my aunt. Well, I sure would like to see so-and-so. And all of this comes about through emotions. And these people are constantly given the same message. And it's fighting against something in you. And it's time that no, none of you allow it to win anymore. Any of you know what it's fighting? It's fighting something directly in you. It's causing a different type of issue right now. You know what it's fighting? Your faith is fighting your belief in Christ, your belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know that, don't you? It's attempting to destroy your passion for the gospel. How many of you in the last two years, you tried to read the gospels? You tried to go back to the gospels, but even you found it did not hold your interest, which means your carnal mind, your mind, it wasn't held by the gospel. The appeal of it somehow is drifting. Don't answer, don't do that. Just think about this. Because this is very real, and things are changing. And if you knew what those changes are leading up to within months and not years, then you'd understand the urgency behind certain things that men of God are saying and women of God are saying. And yes, I said women of God. If you read the Bible, you understand what the apostles did with culture and because of culture in those specific places, and what God did, and what was admitted by the other apostles, each one had to work within the confines of the culture they preached in. People miss that all the time. Your faith is being fought. The appeal of the gospel is being removed and confusion is starting to settle in. And many of you are finding yourselves, you're fighting yourself. I would almost wager if I was a betting guy that you sat down by yourselves one day and said, what is this? Why can't I have that same motivation reading the gospel like I did before? What is happening? See, most people ignore it like it doesn't exist, but it's getting worse because something is directly fighting your belief. And guess what? If you don't think that fight is real, all you have to do is do a real, a real heart check concerning your belief system. Now, 
and your belief system back then. Back then you believed that people could be saved. Back then you believed that it didn't matter who it was, Christ could touch them. Many don't believe that now. How many people that we did not speak of have we condemned? That we say in our hearts there's no hope for that person, or that person's totally given over, so there's no hope for them. We don't have any authority, nor the inside, to ever say that. But we do it anyway, because something is fighting your faith, and it's starting to take its place. And if you're not careful, you're going to advocate for the message those in Revelation advocated for. And it's not that they didn't know who God was. You have to know God to hate him. They absolutely hated him. And they said he was doing what was being found on the earth. Every time something happened in the earth, they blamed him. They blasphemed him. They said it was him. And they still would not repent. And they knew who he was. We're very close to that point. Now you live in a time where the big things take place. Everything we've experienced up until this point has been minute. Even the world wars, even all the lives lost in every single catastrophe, it has been minimal. When something of magnitude happens, it'll frighten the whole world. Men will anger the whole world. Many will start moving away from their foundational beliefs into something else. And the other components come upon the scene. Those hidden things will have enough elbow room to operate. You're in the way right now because of your belief. Even if your belief is tiny, you're still in the way. That will change. See, I can't help but to believe in prophecy. And I know that the world's going to end up just like the Lord said. But I'll tell you something. Every life is precious. And there's still time. We don't know how much time. We know that time is going to be very challenging. You're right around the corner from something. And no, there is no discernment that's causing anybody to shout it out. Kind of reminds me of an operation that they had a long time ago. Do anybody remember Operation Starfish? Why in the world were they given operation dealing with nuclear weapons and explosions in the heavens of nuclear weapons? Why would they relate that to some sea life form? Why would they ever do that? Because while people are looking in one direction, something else is happening. While people are thinking one thing, something else is taking place. It's just like they, they really think that Oppenheimer and all those guys, that they were, they were working at a breakneck pace, that they really needed to develop a nuclear weapon to win the war, as what everybody thought. See, but history contradicts all these populist theories. When you, especially when you find out the locations where they were exploding these things, especially when you find out how many they actually blew up and at what magnitude these weapons were, and that Russia made the biggest one mankind has ever seen, even to this date. They have the biggest nuclear weapon on the face of the earth that can do some real damage. Most of them, right, most of these nuclear weapons, they can destroy, you know, at a high yield, they can destroy probably the continent of the USA. Russia has one that can destroy the entirety of the earth. Back then, they made the biggest one, the, the um, Tsar Bomba. Now, just imagine a nuclear weapon six times bigger than that. Just think of that one. That's a yield that will blow our atmosphere away. And mankind is sitting here messing around with Russia the way they are. They know exactly what they're doing. They're probing. These are probing operations. But there's also something else going on. There always has been. There's always been another mechanism to all wars. It is not what you read in the papers. It will not be discussed. Unfortunately, you live in the time where you're going to be direct witnesses of it. And it's going to confuse you to pieces. You're not going to understand. That's when people are going to have real fear. If you think a nuclear weapon can cause you fear, it's not going to cause you fear anywhere near what a, a type of disclosure is going to give you. We're not talking about some ETs either, because the problems that mankind has dealt with have always been here. Mankind has been warned numerous times. They continue to persist. Mankind has been at war for a long time, attempting to be his or her own God, and it's not working. Mankind has also been compromised. And we're not talking about lizards. And we're not talking about what people are familiar hearing about. It's not what we're talking about. No, we're talking about something far different. Let me give you something real confusing. You ready? In Revelation, it actually states God will destroy those who destroy the earth. That's very confusing, isn't it? See, here a lot of Christians. They start talking about tree huggers, people who love trees and save the trees, save the trees. Well, instead of 
putting all that energy in the rhetoric against those who are trying to save all the trees and grass and everything else, they ought to look into why all of a sudden did a generation come up thinking this way? Why are they so subject to it? And if you look back in history, not you don't have to go past the 70s. You'll find out why. But can it be believed? Most people, I don't think they have the capacity to truly understand it because it goes against some of the fascinating books you've read. Let's go ahead and tell you something else. A lot of people have capitalized, money-wise, on the fears and the imaginations of the world. Let's go ahead and face it. We live in a sci-fi hungry world, don't we? Everybody likes sci-fi. Everybody's familiar with the movies. Why is it that some of these stories fit what they have come out with in sci-fi? Well, the real stories don't fit sci-fi at all. They just don't. That's why they're going to mess people up. They're going to have their shock and awe. Because while everybody is looking for some ET thing to come from outer space, something else is going to take place, and people are not prepared for that. In fact, there's a component at work, and it's winning, and humanity is losing. But we have gotten so used to ignoring what's actually happening and living in our own imaginative worlds that we sometimes we really think we have it going on, and we don't. And things are degrading all around you fast. And people are wondering right now, why can't things be solved? Even some of the problems that you see that continue to happen are designed to keep you occupied. Well, see, the only way you're really going to understand this, the, the surface half of it, is to understand the game that people are playing. Regarding the news and television, all these stories that they pick out, this, that, and the other. It will explain why they get paid so much. And how can a person get paid so much to report on a bunch of garbage? Why do commercials cost so much? Why are they the driving force of a big portion of our economy? And did you know that of all things, America makes entertainment? We're like a court jester, yet we run the world. Why? How, how does that ever work? Because there's something else happening. All these things people believe in, they happen to be illusions. Well, you could use that word delusion. All the things you operate by are not real to the other folks. They're not necessary. Everything you need to sustain your life is likely not necessary for other folks to sustain their lives. And people buy it hook, line, and sinker. And once they believe it, they go and teach another generation of the same stuff. So you have to kind of get dig, dig past all this popular stuff. There, anything popular, it should raise question marks in your mind. You know, the Lord said something that was very profound, yet sometimes it's hard to grasp. Number one, that the world does not have the truth. That the truth people do not like. The Lord told us that. They don't like the truth. They don't want the truth. They want to live by lie. They like things that are consumable by way of the flesh. They do not like the truth, which means they have constructed a world. Babies are born in that world. They construct it, but the babies can't see the walls of this world. That is a strong delusion. In fact, to live in this life thinking that all these elements you're dealing with are real, is that not delusional? People find it necessary to maintain the system. In fact, they become advocates of the system. And if you start speaking against the system or do something any other way, there's always someone who will fight for the system. The system has a life of its own. It does not need people. People are born. They're raised up in this convincing system because guess what convinces us? Loss, pain, sickness, reward, punishment. These are physical things that bind us up psychologically. And because we don't want to experience pain, discomfort, loss, we start to go along with those other attributes mankind has developed so you can operate within them while they themselves stay untouchable. So those in a delusion, as it turns out, are those who believe that these things in the world are real. And isn't it funny how that if you believe the things in the world are real, you can't believe that the gospel is real too. Isn't that funny? Why the contradiction? Because if you believe in the gospel, you have to start discounting things in the world. If you believe the words of Christ, then somebody's lying in the world. And the Lord warned us about the devices Satan uses, like money. But here's the thing about money. Money is necessary to live in this system. It's not necessary anywhere else, just the system. You have to have money. Why? Because they have created a system where everything is weighed by money. Personally, I believe that's what Revelation stands for. I believe that's Revelation with the black horse, with the balances. I do believe that. 
See, a lot of people think that, you know, everything's going to collapse. Everything always collapses. And then it comes back again. And then it collapses. Then it comes back again. Why? Because it's a man-made system. Man can make anything they built collapse. They can also reconstruct anything they collapse themselves. Money is a construct. It's something they made necessary, a control mechanism. Just like good behavior in a prison is necessary if you want to get out your cell. So guess what? You end up doing what? Having good behavior because you want out of the cell. Conformance to get out of jail is necessary. That's why people act good to get out of jail and then they act bad when they get back on the streets and go back to jail. Money is the same way. Money causes people to bow, to yield. It doesn't matter who you are. No matter how strong you are, how weak you are, everybody bows when it comes to money. Why? Because all of us have learned something very important about money. When you don't have money, you can't make it. You can't. What are you going to eat? How are you going to have shelter, clothing, any of that stuff? Somebody has to have money because all things are governed through a monetary system, through the system of buying and selling. And in Revelation, when those balances are given, because back then in those days, you didn't have to have money to eat. You had your own farm and everything else, right? But when those balances are bought out, a measure of wheat for a penny, that means you now have to purchase everything with money. Isn't that something? And that was one of the seals. See, I don't believe it's something that's going to happen. I believe it's something that's already happened. I believe that's one of the big ones that's already happened. I'm a simple-minded individual. I I get into no depth when it comes to the Word of God. It's, It's quite simple. An establishment that everybody has to have money to buy their food, to buy their oil, to buy their whatever they buy. It's all governed by money system. Isn't that something? So people are under the system. But here's the problem. A lot of people don't believe that. So you should know that up front. Right? A lot of people don't believe that. I happen to believe that. In fact, I happen to believe that a lot of things have happened. The reason why we can't see it, and the reason why people keep looking for the same thing over and over again, is because they're denying the prison they're in right now. They're in denial. In the Bible, it says a delusion, and it also says God will send that delusion, not man. Now, because it said God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, here's what I believe. How is God going to send that delusion? Through the breaking of the seals. I, I just believe that. Because man doesn't do it, Satan doesn't do it, God does. And if God does it, everything God did, he revealed to his prophets, didn't he? But it affects us. And sure enough, there we are in Revelation. Kaboo, there it is. So I just believe in that simplicity. So it's already there. It's kind of like the first horse that takes peace from the earth. There's been no peace in the earth, right? Well, you guys already know my views on this. I believe that we're in the middle of something. And it's very difficult to see generation to generation because we get so used to it. We can no longer see it. Hopefully you guys are getting the gist of the foundation of this conversation that things are happening right now. They're largely being ignored because of who we're listening to. We're not talking about listening to mankind either. We're actually listening to the world. We're gauging what's real and what's not based on the world. When you were innocent, your mind was different. You saw the world very differently. You still had those physical things going on, but you saw things different. Now, when you lost that, something left you, didn't it? Your state of existence changed it did there was a physical change a spiritual change something that most can never get back again so your innocence has been lost in fact once you lose that once you get exposed to that uh, high state in the flesh you start thinking differently because if you're operating in the flesh at a super high level you've never operated at before you're breaking a barrier that was previously unbroken It's almost like it allows a person's body to breach something that has never been breached. And once it does this, a hunger builds up in your body. Not just of the one thing, but of a bunch of things. Because there's no doubt when this took place, most people, when that time took place, most people experimented with breaking the barrier of their own innocence. And they even knew it. And they knew what was what was about to happen and once that barrier of your own innocence is broken you're exposed to a brand new world and you can't get that innocence back it feels like right so when you read this i want you to think of yourselves and that you were in one state prior to that point in a different state after that point now never forget you are appointed to be the redeemed take note that those who continue to follow christ Those who endure until the end, those are the ones that will be saved. 
not those who give up. If you give up, how can there be salvation? Because to give up means you truly did not believe. You cannot quit on something you truly believe in. You just can't do it. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and he shall live. Now all of us understand that right after that happened, later on in life when we had come to Christ, we do understand there was a strong call on us following Christ wholeheartedly, something that many of us wrestled with, correct? And there's a difference between reading the Bible and following Christ. A devil can read the Bible. It takes a believer to follow Christ. Not to follow Christ to slay him like devils do, but to actually follow him, to begin to live by his example, his words, his way. That takes a true believer. It continues, it says, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Verse 5. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall utterly go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Now, why would he ever say that? She's lost her state of being, right? So he's saying, don't go, don't go to Gilgal. Don't go to Beersheba. You know what? These represent something in times of old. When that happened to us and we lost something, all of us felt we lost something. We had, we had breached a level of our lives. You know what we did? One of the first things you begin to do is you say, oh, wow, I've got to, I got to change. You start changing who you hang around. Did you notice? Your so your hunger starts to develop and almost immediately you start surrounding yourselves with those who have more to offer in a very specific way. Did you take note? You didn't hang around those who were innocent anymore because you couldn't see them like you once saw them. You desired something else. And immediately, after God is talking about Israel losing her virginity, he says, don't go to this place. Don't go to that place. Seek me. Don't seek those other people. Because he already knew that once you lose your state of innocence, you're going to begin to want something else. It's like a child who would taste meat for the first time or who would taste sweets for the first time. If they're eating baby food or drinking some formula and you give them sweets, they could get to a point where they'll never take that formula again because they'll now crave the new thing and crave that new thing. Now you see the world differently. With a baby, now their taste buds begin to open up and they desire more new things. Yeah, give me something new. Don't give me the same because I just found out I can have new stuff and that's better than the same old stuff we've been having. How would it happen to those who were in the wilderness and they had manna, bread from heaven, can you believe that? And all of a sudden they said, well, we're tired of that. We want something else. How can you eat heavenly food that changed them physically, desiring something else because they were fighting their own flesh? That wasn't spirit, that was flesh. That's the appetite of the flesh. They had to have meat. They couldn't have something clean and wholesome that was just absolutely changing their bodies. Because you know their bodies changed. Their skin changed. Their teeth changed. Stuff was healed and repaired within them from eating manna. Do you guys know that? Their eyes became very bright white. Their physiology changed. They were able to do things that nobody else was able to do. And it's right there in the Bible. Nobody else was able to do it. And then in the Bible, they start to call out the changes, the differences between those who ate the manna and those who turned back to Egypt. And there was a there was a sheer difference. They could always tell because those who ate the manna walked around brighter than those who didn't. They had different eyes, different teeth, different skin, different hair, different everything. All of them were in health. None was sick. They were quite robust and strong. Something was happening. But guess what they did? They said, oh, we don't want any more of that. We want the meat. So they couldn't even finish that process. See, later on in the Bible, there was a few statements that if they would have continued eating the manna from heaven, they would have been completed. But they didn't want that. Their body was craving something else. So they couldn't even deal with the process that completes them. They had to have that messed up because of the flesh, because of what they desired. Isn't that something? So they would always choose something different. They would always choose something different. My goodness, the Bible has so much in it. It is so rich and answers so many questions. The problem is, if you believe the world's way of things, well, you'll never discover these things in the Word of God. Let me continue this. This is important, though. Let me continue this. So he says, Seek the Lord, and you shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. You know, it's almost like he's forecasting. Uh, I already know what you're going to do with Bethel. I already know. 
what you're about to adopt upon yourselves, right? Because if you go to a place, what happens when you go to a place? If you guys went to the UK and stayed there for six months, do you not know you'd have an accent just like those in the UK? You come back say, oh, say, uh, from around the world there. You start talking like that, you know, having a spot and tell you with that type of accent. It happened to me. I went over there and I didn't know it, but I was talking like these guys. And I couldn't, you know, get it back to the way I talked before. You start picking up accents. That happened to me in Egypt. That happened to me in Germany. It did. It happened to me in so many different places. I was like, what's going on here? Because you don't pay attention, but you start to adopt the language, something you do repeatedly in the places you're in. You start doing it all the time and you don't even realize Satan has set up offenses to keep people in this stage of stupidity so that people naturally, they just start drudging up these man-made ideologies and so they never take in any real wisdom. Why? Because Satan has planted lies and he has planted deceits to cause people to, to shun things that they shouldn't. Not one Christian should be afraid of what the stars are named. God made creation, not Satan. But you see how astrologers who forecast based on astrology have perverted something that was given to people a long time ago. God's angels will introduce themselves to you. They will let you know who they serve. When they're doing their business, they're doing their business. And if you think this world is not managed, you believe the world too much. Everything in this world is managed. It aggravates all governments to this very day. There's a reason they have reverence for certain things. And there are certain subjects they will not touch because they've been told not to. And if mankind could do everything he wanted to, this earth would have been destroyed many times over. But do yourselves a favor and find out how many times wars have been averted through the failure of weaponry, full squadrons, aircraft. Look, how can you go to Vandenberg Air Force Base and not one aircraft operates? How does that work? How do you go to Fort Hill, Texas, and not one tank will start? How do you hang out in Colorado, and not one chopper will fly? How do people get locked in a Cheyenne Mountain? That's funny, isn't it? How did all the nuclear weapons, how did all that data point those weapons back to the capitals of every country they were from? And that happened for one hour, and then they were released. How can nuclear material be turned inert? I'll tell you something man already knows. They have zero defense against what they call overlords, but we can call them the watchers, the ones that were reappointed. Everything is managed on this earth. Why do you think they have so many reports of these orange things leaving volcanoes going back and forth? And then all of a sudden they may erupt. Mexico, do you guys know it wasn't more than it happened again 10 years ago? Mexico calls the United States of America. You know what their complaint was? These things are taking our water. They still have that complaint that these things are taking our water. People were dispatched to Mexico. This happened about 30 years ago. People were dispatched and they wanted to assist. They thought it was like gangs or something still in the water. They said, no, it's just UFOs. What? <laughs> and they couldn't do anything about that. You guys don't know the interactions. Hillary knows her own interactions. And what she was keeping at bay at our southern border, and it was not immigrants. There's a bigger story there. There's something else going on there. They don't know what to do about it. It's only a matter of time before everybody's involved in this and things simply don't hide themselves. When they're given the go-ahead to go, people are going to have genuine fear because man is so prideful, so smart. They know what does exist and what does not. Wrong people, for the most part, have been spoiled by sci-fi movies. Nothing is like the movies. Not one thing is like the movies. But I'll tell you something. When it's all said and done, you're going to say, Lord, thank you. You didn't show me any of that. Because how could I ever live my life? How could I ever get to a point of humility? How could I ever have any enjoyment whatsoever in the world knowing so much? Let me give you an example about knowledge. And this is real, not fake. And it has nothing to do with anything in the spiritual realm. You ready? Right now in America, there are about 50,000 children. They're so hungry, their stomachs are swelling. Now go eat dinner and have a good dinner. Can you do that? If you knew for a fact that that number was much higher than 50,000, that these children were in pain, how could you ever sit down and eat at dinner without thinking about those children? How could you laugh and joke at a table having knowledge of that? If you had real knowledge of that, you could not. You couldn't even function nor operate properly. You couldn't do it. So what does the Lord do? He does not expose you to everything. He didn't do that. Even though it's real, even though there are consequences behind it, you're protected from knowing certain things because if you knew them, 
could not live your life. That's the burden of a leader. That's why most of them drink themselves to pieces. That's why they become so 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 shifty as leaders because they get they gain knowledge of these things. They see these things on a daily basis. And you can't be a leader unless you can stomach that kind of stuff. How could anyone ever smile? How could they do that? Having knowledge of that. I, I'll be the first to tell you, I've seen enough. And it has caused, people ask me all the time, how come you don't go on vacation? I don't want to go on vacation. I don't want to take a break. I don't want to rest. I don't want any of that stuff. I do not. I'm living my life just fine without any of the extras. What I need to do is make a difference. Because if I don't, I know that somebody out there, nobody else is making a difference for them. They're for, people are, are forgotten in this nation and other nations. Nobody remembers that. So when God gives you knowledge or puts you in a place where you see these things, you can't go back to normal. So you could say I lost my virginity of not knowing quite a few things. And because of that, if I'm an honest person, then there's no way I'm going to forget about them. I will never overindulge. I'll never have more than what I need. There'll be a part of life I will never partake in. Do you know why? Because I'll always seek to find them. That's why. Always. It's like a non-ending pursuit and it never ends. But God didn't expose everybody to those things, did he? He didn't expose most of you guys to that, did he? So be thankful. But what mankind is doing is they're trying to find out things that are even heavier than somebody starving to death. Because if people knew the story about what the fallen were actually doing, how could you even have life? You're not going to be the same. And if you're a husband, if you're a wife, if you got family involved, I'm telling you right now, your, your paradigm is going to change. It, it will probably fall apart. You cannot sleep in your bed knowing some of the threats that do exist and what's happening to other folks without godly protection. You wouldn't rest. So God is very kind and he does not let people have that whole story because he already knows they would not be able to survive. They would self-destruct. Men have learned. Men have been dragged into learning knowledge. You know what most of them do? They commit suicide. That's what they do. They don't see the point anymore. It is that is so heavy that they kill them. We're, we're talking about battle-hardened men and women who learn of certain things and go and end their own life hours after that. We're talking about parents who have children who go and end their lives once their eyes are open to certain things. You're talking about people who end their kids' lives once they learn about certain things. That's what's awaiting the world. Because I'll tell you right now, the world's going to find out and it will not be pretty and nothing goes back to normal when that day to see everybody hollers disclosure. There's not going to be any disclosure like that because one thing will lead to another, which will lead to another, which will lead to another. And there'll be mass suicides all over the earth if that happened. People think they want to know. God knows exactly what he's doing. And I'll clue you in on something. You will know what you're able to handle in truth. That's what you'll know. You'll know exactly what you're able to handle. If you're not able to handle it, you can look all day. You're not going to find it. Because the Lord loves you. He didn't want to push you away. He didn't want you destroyed. That stuff will destroy your mind because it will cause nothing to make sense. And it's just like losing your virginity. It's totally different. It's not the same. It's, and you don't want your mind to open up to all that stuff. You don't want, you don't want to know that. You, you really don't. But when you're ready for it, you'll see it. But guess what? Those were not covered. They're going to see it when they're not ready for it. And they will not be able to die. So I'll tell you right now that the world plays with people dancing. They, they push these ideas out there. People make it a big thing. No one is going to disclose that stuff. They're just not going to do it. People will see an example of a man-made thing. I strongly believe that. Not something of another world. They're going to see a man-made thing. They're going to use that for the unification of people to a cause, to whatever cause they want to. But as far as seeing the real thing, they don't even operate like that. How can something millions of years old just crash in a desert? Come on. They go caught on to that after it happened. That's called seeding. That's how you get mankind to do specific things. That's how special ops can get the regular army to pursue certain avenues because they have no communications as far as planning. Did you guys know that? There are special units that have no contact with public government. And the only way to get a public army to pursue a specific path is to stage something because they do not communicate. And mankind has gone much further than what you realize. They can't disclose that because you would never agree with what the actual cost was. We're not talking about money. We're talking about lives. 
How many lives are lost for a battery? How many lives have been lost for a certain type of propulsion? You never agree to it. And when you find out that many of these kids were 15, 16, 17, that they were walking around in your neighborhood, right? you don't even have to know what you're signing up for. You can be in your neighborhood and be a test subject right now and you'd never know it. And when somebody dies, they give it some weird cause. Doctors know. A lot of doctors can't even look you in the face because they know what their medical billing codes have in there. They know what pops up on the screen when certain symptoms arise in certain times of the year for people. They know exactly what's happening. You better thank God that you don't know that yet. Get rooted first before it's too late because the clock is counting and people are not going to have time to catch up soon enough. When you're trying to focus upon the Lord, you get in the way. Everything you have exposed yourself to everything you have left undone that's when it comes up that's when it surfaces so there there's actually a layer you have to get through and the first layer is you not so much the enemy but you your will your own personal will you have to get through your own personal will and once you settle that that's when you find things are a bit different than what you thought many of you no doubt you have things undone in your life many of you right now if i were to say write down something you want to do in your life you would have something to write you say, well, I want to do this, and I want to accomplish this, and I think I can accomplish this. I don't do that anymore. If somebody asks me, what do you want to accomplish in your life? I don't write anything down. Do you know why? Because I don't leave things off anymore. I have a habit of just getting up and going and doing things. I used to live in the future, only in my mind. Do you know how you have plans for the future? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I used to live there. I don't live there anymore. I just get up and do things. So I don't, I don't necessarily sit back and do nothing right now and live in the future. I don't do that. I found out something that half the plans that we make mentally, we either forget or we never get time to do them anyway. So the best way to live your life is in this moment today. Now you're about to see, having said all that, you're about to see something here. So let me continue to read. So the Lord is saying, seek him. Seek him, verse 9, that strengtheneth the spoiled against the strong. He makes strong the spoiled against the strong, so that the spoil shall come up against the fortress. This undoes everything you believe in. He really does. God will take the, you know how people say, God helps those who help themselves? Wrong. That's absolute. I don't know where that, that came from mankind. That is not of the most time. I've heard that so many times. That's ridiculous. Do you know why? <clears throat> there were so many times I did not help myself, but the Lord God delivered me from so many things. I didn't help myself doing that. No. God also took people who didn't deserve much and made them rulers over those who deserve much more. How about that? So all these earthbound sayings that were sewn into our minds, you have to start to undo that. I used to hear that so much. God helps those who help themselves, right? But th that's when people had this strange message. Well, God wants you to work, 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 work. No, God wants you to walk in the ways of righteousness every single day. Working doesn't make you righteous. You can work in the worst places on earth doing the worst things. You can work as a as a hitman. That okay, God doesn't want you to do that. No. No, he wants you to follow Christ. And when you follow Christ, guess what happens? You want to be useful for somebody else. You start doing all of what you can do to get resources for the sakes of everybody else. You don't go around collecting resources for yourself. You have a purpose behind everything you do. And everything you do normally has meaning. See, that's very different. Verse 10, they hate him that rebuketh in the gate, <clears throat> and they abhor him, that means hate him, that speaketh uprightly for as much. Therefore, as your treading is upon your poor, listen, as your treading is upon the poor. Now, you guys answer this. Did you hear this? For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor. Do you know <clears throat> that those who believe in Christ these days, if you're not careful, you're going to fall deeper into a trap that the world has set. I've noticed what constitutes a poor person. Anybody know? What makes a person poor? Is it because they have no furniture? Is it because they have no money? Wouldn't a person also be poor if they didn't have the spirit? Wouldn't a person also be poor if they didn't have a lot of righteousness? They're also poor. See, we can't just think of, of, of some type of poor that we can see this tangible poorness, right? We have to look at the spirit too. God made a promise to those. Oh, did he not make a promise to those? who didn't have enough of the spirit. You know how when you're down and out and you say, I can't even believe enough to have faith in Christ to get me through this. Did you not know that at that moment you're poor in spirit and that the Lord is with you? Do you know why? Because the poor in spirit have a genuine request 
They also tell the truth, don't they? They tell the truth about their situation. That means life has gotten them to the point that they're no longer trying to exploit themselves or project themselves as being this strong spiritual figure in front of everybody else. No, what they do is start telling the truth. I can't believe in it. Lord, I don't have the mind to even understand what you're saying. And the Lord comes to those who do that. They're truly blessed because they're truly starting out in righteousness when they do that. Righteousness does not begin in our projecting all the strength that we do. You know how people project themselves as knowing everything in the Word of God? And you don't even want to comment with them. Because if you do, you know something's going to pop up. In fact, you can discern the Spirit very easily. And it's not that those people are not going to be like, or they have no one's going to help or anything else. It's just that God resists the proud. And if I'm the person with all the answers, that's pride, isn't it? If I'm always going around making myself a teacher to everybody, why would I do that? Why would I get into a conversation initializing something that nobody else requested? You know what the Lord said? Ask and you shall receive. So what happens if you don't ask? You're not going to receive. In other words, when people want to know about the Word of God, I've learned to allow them to initiate things. And you know what happens when that takes place? Because I never, I don't walk up to people unless the Lord has given me something spiritually. I do not walk up to people doing a bunch of stuff. But the Lord will bring people to me and people don't yet understand that. Why is God leading so many people to you? You don't have answers like me. I said, no, I don't. I don't have answers like that. But I'm willing to listen to the Lord for them. You know, you know what the true thing is? I have a genuine heart to see everybody else go right into the kingdom of God. Because I know what it is to be left out in the cold. I have experience for everyone to turn their back. I know what it's like to be backstabbed, trodden down, taken advantage of all those good things. I know what that is. And so when I start looking at other people and they're not making it, right? Like a person who curses too much. If they're cursing too much, then they're mentally not in the right place. See, what turns the other person away normally attracts me. And what attracts the other people normally turns me away. If a person looks like they have it all, what, what can I do for that person? I seek to assist people. If a person has the answers, they don't need my assistance. That's not what they need. It's the people who they've ran out of answers. They don't have the answer. And they freely admit it. I never go to the ones who say, oh, I'm all right. Well, if they're okay, they haven't come to the point of surrender yet. I can't reach them. If the Lord can't reach them, how can I reach them? But when a person reaches a specific point and they know they have been beaten down a little bit, their ears are open to anybody who speaks that language of God's love and righteousness. And you don't find yourself at war trying to make somebody believe something, trying to make, I never try to make somebody see something. I have a one person, they probably don't want me to say this, but they will ask me a question. I'll say, well, wait a minute. You can't make a blind person see anything and you cannot cause a deaf person to hear what you're saying. So what are you doing? Then they get it. The Lord said, let those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. Those who can see, then let them see. If you cannot see, how can the Lord show you anything? And if you cannot hear, how can he cause you to perceive? He's not forceful like that. When you have ears to hear, that's when you want to hear. The Lord gives instruction that you need to, at that point, you have to seek him wholeheartedly. Now, most people don't tell us this. Most people don't even cover losing your virginity in a Christian setting. They don't do that. But I'm telling you right now, there was a change in your spirit when this happened. And God has a process he mentioned. I, b- I believe he mentioned this 42 times the same process for what happens when virginity is lost. Number one, he says, do not go to those advisors that are not him. They're out there. Don't go there. So, and if you look back at Gilgal and Bethel, you're going to notice something. It's not that these places were just outright outcasts. No, they had specific viewpoints and they had errors with them, very specific errors. It's almost like God is saying, don't follow people who have this high sense of aggression. Don't follow people who would melt in the world with the Holy Word of God. Don't, don't do the compromise thing. Now, listen, if you think, well, my time has passed, just skip me. Don't think that. This is a continual process that you're under. You may not know this, but you lost your virginity back then, but you're becoming a virgin right now. That's what you may not know. The ways you lost it back then, new ways are being put upon you right now. You're returning to innocence. I know it sounds controversial, but you're returning to innocence. 
This is in truth a return to innocence, a return to the time when all things are permissible, because all of what you had within you was not dark. It was in fact innocent. You are returning to that, to actually beyond that innocence, because the innocence you had in the body was just of the body. And although it did something to you spiritually, it gave you more to contend with spiritually. You're returning to an innocence you couldn't, you nor I could possibly comprehend. But I tell you what, we can feel it every step of the You can both feel this, you can see this, you can experience this is a real pain. But God has given very specific instruction, which is why if you guys hear me all the time. I say the same thing every time. Do not take part in the violence. Now, back in the times of old with Joshua, men were told to go to war against certain nations, correct? Not so this time. You're not to be a part of it. For many of you, it's going to be the hardest decision you'll ever make. You know why? Because your community is going to have the power around you, the power to oust you, to get rid of you, to kick you out from among them. Haven't you noticed that right now, everything is being separated into groups. Everybody is being separated into groups. And if you go against these groups, you're out of there. Me, I do not agree with any earthly group. I just won't do it because the Holy Spirit is very true and the word is true and the world does not have the truth. Men's ways are founded in error. They follow the ways of flesh and are to please those things of flesh. I seek to follow those spiritual things. I already told you I had to look behind the curtain, right? So you could say that there are many animals in this world that seek to devour you. Christians, those who believe, they don't want to be your friend. They don't want you to be a meal. They want you to be devoured and done away with. You're in the way. You're something to be knocked down. They need to hang you a shameful thing to the Most High. And every time we give in to certain ways, God is now warning us. We put ourselves in league with that same darkness. Why do you think for Lot's wife? If she turned around, if they turned around, they would be turned into a pillar of salt. Why not give that to anybody else there? No, that was for people who believed. So why would they ever turn into a pillar of salt? Why not just turn into dust? Why a pillar of salt? Well, first of all, a pillar of salt, you can see. A pillar of salt is something that the people of the world would have eventually devoured also. But most of all, it was a monument, a monument to be devoured and a reminder. See, that's why Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. So to turn somebody into a pillar of salt, that's almost like, what is that like? That's almost like Satan's mockery of what one truly was. You used to be the salt of the earth. Now you're the salt of the earth to be devoured. No longer the salt of the earth, just for flavor, but salt of the earth to be devoured. Now you're no good for anything but to be devoured. Why not just, you know, just obliterate the person, no trace left? That pillar of salt is extremely important and why they were turned into a pillar of salt. One of the prophets spoke at length about this, but when you're turned into a pillar of salt, any pillar, period, you actually stand for something in this case. It's a reminder. Satan does not want you to join his team. If you turn your back on the living God, if you cast away all things Christ, you're no good to Satan. And do you know what that means? That means he's already ready to devour you. He would join forces with somebody else, but not for you. You've already been touched. You've already been marked so that if you ever look back, you will die. Satan wants nothing to do with you, but for you to stand as a mockery against Christ. He'll use you as ammunition against the Messiah, but he will not join forces with you and you will not gain power with him. That's why we're never to look back. These days, these groups in the earth, they're trying to get you to go back, to look back. And in the process of looking back, you're going to see it during the falling away. Many people are already falling away. Just because a person reads the word of God, just because a person preaches the word of God does not mean they are believers. See, belief is something that Satan has fought from the very beginning to distort, to confuse your belief. When you read the gospel of Jesus Christ, one may say, I already know this, but that's only Satan trying to attack you to get you not to read it so that your beliefs are not solidified. And if you take careful inventory of your life, you're going to find that this Satan has been attacking your belief in Jesus. He's been attacking that belief. Many of you used to look at scripture and because it didn't work for you, you started to re-examine scripture and interpret it a different way. We're not to lean onto our own understanding. And if you don't lean onto your own understanding, 
How then can you come up with anything? No, we're supposed to have revelation from the living God. That's how we know what we know. But there's an element in the earth, an element that's going to be utilized like a catalyst to cause all those who seek to reinterpret the word of God is going to give them help. It's there to support you reinterpreting the word of God. And it will support. Now here's how it works. It always works in darkness. What is darkness? Darkness is in secret. Darkness is in hiding. Darkness is never out in front of everybody all at the same time in the in the decent times. Darkness is in secrecy. In the closet, a whisper. That's what darkness is. Hey, come here. Let me show you this. What it really means. Be careful. The Holy Spirit will never pull you to the side. And let me tell you what this really means. No. What God gives now, he does not give in secret. He gives by way of the Spirit, which means all of us have it. So if he gives me an interpretation, and I speak that interpretation, and it be of the Holy Spirit, every single last one of you will say amen, all those of you who believe. Because God no longer gives anything in secret, but by way of the Holy Spirit, which all of us experience. Christ is with us, how? Via the Holy Spirit. He already said so. I will pray to the Father, he will sing you another comforter. In my name, he'll sing you the Holy Spirit. That's what the book of Acts is about in the beginning. These men are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it's about the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. Then it goes into that prophecy. The pouring out of the Spirit of God's Spirit upon all flesh. That's what that is. That's how the Lord is with us. Right now, that's how he said he would be with us. And what did he say? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Why do you think you have conviction? When you do something wrong, something speaks to you and says, Ah, that's wrong. Now it's not going to say it too many times. We come up with excuses on why we have to do it. But that voice of conviction says, you know, this is wrong. Don't go that wrong. We already know. That's what conviction is. But there's another element in the earth. Something that works in darkness. Something that will whisper your name. Something that will grab your ear in a dream and say, hey, you're special. Of all the human beings, you're special. That's how darkness works. God is a God of a family. Darkness works by edifying the one to cause you to compete with all things of the Messiah and then to cast down his word to the ground. That's how darkness works. It will interpret for you what you already know. And if you listen to it and entertain it, you'll start believing the interpretation, not because it confirms something within you, but by weight of evidence, it will convince you. Do you hear me? God gives what he gives by way of revelation. No one need, you know, the Bible says, no man need teach you anything. That's in the word of God. So why are people constantly peeking around going, hey, come here. Let me tell you what this really means, what God is really saying. No, God said exactly what he said. Don't tell me what God is really saying, because he'll tell me too. He's not going to just tell you. I'm speaking English, right? If I spoke Mandarin, Chinese, or Korean, you couldn't understand what I was saying. Why? Because that language is not in you for all those of you who speak English. It has to be in you for you to understand. God established the truth in us from the beginning. You could not be on this earth if the truth was not putting you. And all those who end up being with Christ were of the Father in the first place. So that means you came from the source of truth. How can you be absent the truth? That's why you read the word and you say amen to something you never read before. Because you have understanding of it. But in these days, men are changing the concepts. They're ultimately going to dethrone Christ out of people's lives. And that will be replaced by a figure on this earth. Be careful of darkness. God's way was meant for a child to understand it. You know, it's funny because a child is innocent. And in that innocence, the word surely opens up. It will not open up with a plan of deceit in your heart. But there's an element coming that will comfort every deceitful and complicated plot you ever had. It will uphold every wretched thing you can think of. And it will call it good. It compensates for the flesh. It dares to call acts of the flesh good you remember when somebody in the bible called the messiah good and the messiah stopped him jesus stopped him said uh-uh the father is good you call him good don't call anything down here good see he was correcting people he was telling them man is the one that complicated things man simply did this they built a system with many complicated mechanisms they mastered their own creation and set themselves up to be powerful because nobody else knew how to use it. Generation by generation, they taught people to live by their mechanism. They become masters of all those generations who depend upon their mechanisms. Only of those who depend upon their mechanisms 
so that the people have to look to them if they want the mechanism to be beneficial to them. That's how they set themselves up in places of power. They're the ones who established the money system. They're the ones who established the governmental systems. They did this. They set themselves up to be just like demigods in the earth. And people worshipped them as gods. The Lord gave us something else. The Lord told us not to love the world. Because if you love the world, you have angry separation of God if you do that. If you love the world and you truly love it, the love of God can't be in you. Because nothing of God was intertwined in this world. Men pervert the good thing and oppress others by it. God does not do that. Men are now calling these systems holy and divine, and they are not. And they have to crumble in front of your faces. Because if they don't crumble in front of your faces, you'll believe that they are divine. In fact, everything men that they worship, all those things must crumble in front of their faces. Because if they don't, men will worship them. If they do, if they if if they don't crumble in front of men, people will worship people. They're doing that now. People are the reason that other people have to crumble because they won't stop worshiping them. So then, what does God do? God simply demonstrates: these people are not me. These people are not the Messiah. And when you see flaws, and when you see bad character flaws, that's when people wash their hands, turn around, start looking for somebody else. But at least they don't have that thing. So people will continue to crumble. Then a darkness in the hearts of most will rise. And they will thirst almost salivate for a man figure. And the beast will step into his platform. And people, they're going to put him on his pedestal. They're going to love what he does. They're going to enforce his principles. They will build an image to the beast. People will do that. Now just in case you haven't noticed... It's only been the last 25 years that mankind has been primed to worship presidents and leaders because that's what they do now. And there are mechanisms in place to take every doubt you ever had or every inclination of the thoughts that you have and point them towards mankind that you would worship them, that you would cry for them. Because if they can get you to cry for a person, if they can get you emotionally attached for a person, you're going to fight for the person and forget the principles. That's what's happened. Haven't you noticed that people are fighting for the person? No longer the position the person held. No, it's become personal. That's what was promised in the end days. Before, it was mostly professional. And it didn't matter how nice the guy was. If he couldn't do his job, people would say, you got to go. Everybody you see has to fail now. Because if they don't, many people who believe in Christ, they're going to be just sifted like wheat. The Lord has already put in place what he said he would do. Everything that we hold up high will fail. That is not God that we hold up high will fail, but only for a season. Because when he who leadeth is removed out of the way, then that matter of perdition is going to come forward. And when he comes forward, people will worship him because of his successes. Now, isn't that ironic? That means you don't worship people for their successes either. Don't look at them for what they do right. Look to the Most High. Be thankful for sending the person who may do something right. But don't worship the person. You will destroy people that way. You have a heart to save your leaders? Remove your worship from them. Realize them with your spiritual eyes and pray for them. And ask that the Lord's will be done upon their lives for the sake of the believers. That's a request. I personally, I never ask that that person succeed in everything they're trying to do. I'll never do that. Because that empowers men. If God were to grant that to every single man, this world would be destroyed a billion times over. I always pray that the Lord's will be done. Because as being people of flesh, we are fundamentally flawed by way of error in our thinking, in our ways that we operate and everything else. So listen to me. The point of tonight is to let you know this. The first innocence that we lost, we understand that we lost it. We also understand that the flesh woke up that day, don't we? Now, Satan can track everything of your flesh. Don't ever think you know more about the flesh than he does. He knows everything about your flesh. He knows what moves you by flesh. He knows how your emotions work. He can utilize that anytime he so desires. Don't be moved by flesh. Understand that you have it? Yes. Understand what it does? Yes. Don't live your life by the cravings of flesh. But return to innocence by way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news of Christ, but it's also the truth. And that truth tells us that this time we live in is about to collapse. Big time. That's good news. If you don't think that's good news that this world is soon to crumble, 
then your heart is with the world and you've got an issue. Did you ever think of that? You know how people say, well, you know, you don't have to get stuck on revelation. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't like the things that men do. This is every single day of my life. I've gotten in trouble so many times from not doing that thing that was so popular with mankind. Do you know that? It is disgusting. And it's not because I'm so perfect. No. But there's what good can a person do on this earth that won't kill somebody else? For every extra piece of food you eat, somebody else is going to starve. Think about that. For every extra dollar that you spend, a family will not eat. That's the truth. The world is set up that in all the good that can be done in it, there's a consequence to somebody else. That's the kingdom or sacrifice is deemed first. This is the darkness of these kingdoms. A lot of people ignore or simply don't know. And they're keeping things and ideologies alive on purpose. Somebody last month, they said, well, it's a good thing they didn't have a race war. What are you talking about? What people see for the most part right now is a race war. They even have genocide happening. When it goes quiet, something else starts up. Why? When everybody's at peace with each other, that's when these killings start. Why? When all the people in America get along together, that's when the border erupts. Why? Because Satan will never sleep, nor will he rest. What's about to happen at the border is going to leave some of you crippled in your hearts. Because no doubt you'll join in with the rhetoric first. Believing in your favorite person. Being duped and drawn in by what you see. I'll tell you right now, some of the leaders do not want to say what they have to say. But if they don't say it, everything they love will be dead. If other leaders don't say it, they're not going to have money. They will be poor. If some leaders don't get behind other people, everything they have will be stripped away. Do you not know that most people in leadership are one phone call away from ruin? Do you know that everybody has something on everybody and they use that as their advantage over somebody else? You can't get in a high position in this world with clean hands. You can't do that. In the very dirt that was done, somebody uses that as leverage to continue the agenda that will never cease until the Messiah comes back and puts an end to it. To believe that this world is operating as presented, that is delusional. Now, another person cannot show this to you. You ask the Lord and it will be disclosed. He'll bring to your eyes the very thing you didn't want to see, but will tell you the truth and have that truth revealed to you. Don't buy the story of the world. Stick with the story of Yahshua HaMashiach. Be careful in these times. Your soul is at stake. Do you hear me? Your soul is at stake. And remember this one last thing. In the world, what's good is evil. And what's evil is good. If the world is calling something good, and if the world is calling something evil, why would you agree with it? See things spiritually where God is no respecter of persons. How about that? Understand your environment because your soul is at stake. And if you join in with the world, if this late in the game, if you start to operate like the world, don't ever think you cannot be lost. Don't ever think that. Those who endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And to endure something means you did not enjoy every day of it. To endure something is to put up with something every single day. It's to resist something every single day. It's not to give in every single day. And the word already says there's going to be a falling away. In fact, the book of Baruch, the book of Esdras, the book of Enoch, the book of Revelation, all these books talk about a remnant. You could say one out of every 10,000 people who believe in Christ, truly believe in Christ. That means a lot of people are going to give in to other things. The last time you got angry or entered into sin, no one forced you. You gave into it, didn't you? You gave into it and you knew you shouldn't have. But it was so easy to choose that, wasn't it? Well, let me tell you this. That's going to be the same way people will fall away. There's going to be that one time the Lord will say, if you do it now, you're going to be lost for an eternity. And people are going to give into it and they will never come back. Don't take his grace and mercy for granted right now. But think about it, that that time will soon be removed. The time where people can be forgiven is going to be removed. That causes Christians who call themselves Christians great fear, doesn't it? It doesn't cause a person fear who's honestly trying to follow all things of Christ. But it will give you fear if you know you have a bad habit of not choosing Christ. 
And the Lord said, if you deny him in view of men, he'll deny you before the angels. Well, I got news for you. It's something I learned. When I agree to enter into sin, I am denying Christ at that very moment. If I know better, but I choose sin, I'm denying Christ at that very moment. Because you cannot enter into sin mindful of what Jesus did at the cross and still agree with that sin. You can't do that. Because if you do, you're denying the cross and the power of the cross and that act, that great act, you're denying it in view of men. See, people make it slight, like denying Christ has to be this big complicated thing. No, if you deny Christ in view of men, is that not denying the cross and his gospel? Because Jesus is his word. He is the very gospel he preached. So to deny that is the only way to agree with sin and then to choose sin over the cross. That's denying Christ and agreeing with darkness. You cannot do both, just like you cannot have two masters. You can't. And these are principles in the Word. And for anybody who would make that slight, they're giving you an excuse to play in darkness. Turn away from people who give you an excuse to play in darkness. And with all your heart, go forward to the cross. Listen, I know by experience. You play in sin. Don't think you won't have consequences when you knowingly enter into sin because you're not doing it ignorantly. Ignorant means you simply don't know. When you agree to sin, there's a consequence because you're not doing it in your innocence. Now, I want you real quick, think of your lives right now and the things that happen in your lives. It is grace that has you still be alive through your issues. And if you look careful enough, those sins you agreed to, you're going to see them in some of what you're reaping in your life. And I'm telling you that you can put all of that down right now you can put all that down right now but it takes you to be very sincere about the cross don't make a declaration you know you cannot follow just get up every single day and have it in your mind and your heart and your soul to walk cleaner every single day god's perfection is not man's perfection and we ourselves cannot do it it takes the power of christ to complete us he will finish the work he began in us he's the author and finisher of our faith we don't have the strength but we can agree and attempt it. That's called faith. And if we do that, it's by his power we'll achieve it. That's how it works. You can achieve it by your power. I can achieve it by my own power. But if I have faith, I can attempt it. I can initialize it. And it's by the power of Christ. He'll complete it in me. That's how you accomplish it. You can't do it by your own power. I already tried that. You can try all you want. It's not going to work. But if you step forward by faith, God will accomplish it in you. With man, it's impossible, but not with God. The Lord will strengthen you to keep his ways. And that's something all of us could do with. That's for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. He will strengthen your walk in him. Somebody says some people might know the word says nobody has that power. Nobody of themselves. They don't have that power. Nobody. Only by Christ. Will it be completed? It will not be completed solely of the person's power. People do not have enough strength to do it. You're fighting an enemy that's already overcome your flesh. We have a newness of spirit that's growing. So it takes Christ to complete us or we will not be complete. Period. So in other words, don't choose the sin and be mindful of that. When the temptations come, when the things come, remember this conversation about sin. Don't choose it. If you have to sit there and fight for an hour, then good, fight for an hour. But remind yourself about the sin and don't choose it. Seek to choose Christ and by faith begin to walk in the wholeness, not the sinfulness. The time we thought we had is shortened. In fact, every single day, time is being shortened. And no one has the time they really think they have. 